Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to today's very important discussion of America's monopoly moment. We are in a monopoly moment. Nearly every relevant point of economic data shows that the concentration of economic power is at historic levels. The Wall Street Journal reported two years ago that nearly a third of U.S. industries would be considered highly concentrated under current federal antitrust standards, while 2015 was the biggest year ever for mergers and acquisitions. Since then, waves of anti-competitive mergers, deals that should never have made it out of the boardroom, have tested the boundaries and durability of the antitrust laws while straining the razor-thin resources of the antitrust agencies. Economic concentration is at a three-decade high and has structurally weakened competition on an economy-wide basis. In the midst of this wave of consolidation, there's also overwhelming evidence that corporations are earning monopoly profits that aren't being reinvested in workers or in the economy. Last month, Gary Cohn, President Trump's top economic advisor, accidentally illustrated this point at a Wall Street CEO conference. There, an audience of CEOs and top executives were asked to raise their hands if they would reinvest savings from tax reform back into the economy. Few did. Cohn laughed nervously and asked, why aren't the other hands up? But it's no mystery why companies that are already enjoying record profits in concentrated industries are under no pressure to invest in their workers or the economy. The Economist described this last year as the hoarding of economic growth by corporate monopolists and economic sickness signaling that companies have become, quote, more adept at siphoning wealth off than creating it afresh, end quote. Professor Carl Shapiro of the University of California at Berkeley, who served as the chief economist in the Justice Department's antitrust division, has reached a similar conclusion, noting that corporations are systematically earning far higher profits than they were 25 or 30 years ago, pointing to a rise in incumbency rents. But on an even more fundamental level, hardworking Americans already know that the economy is not working for them. They feel it in every paycheck, every job application, and every credit card payment. In a seminal speech on America's monopoly problem earlier this year, Nobel laureate Joseph Stieglitz described this as, and I quote, a widespread sense of powerlessness, both in our economic and political life, we seem no longer to control our own destinies, end quote. That's because for too long, wave after wave of large corporate mergers have decimated jobs and wages while rigging the economy against locally owned businesses, working families, and entrepreneurs. Business dynamism, a key measure of productivity and economic growth, has steadily declined over the past several decades as the economy has become dominated by fewer and fewer large corporations. And over 3,000 stores are expected to close this year, double the number of closings during this period last year, while the number of monthly job losses in the retail sector far exceed the losses in every other sector of the economy combined. Declining competition among employers has resulted in lower wages and worse benefits precisely because corporations in concentrated markets have virtually zero incentive to pay fair wages. And while the effects of economic concentration have been devastating for nearly all workers, it most severely harms workers in vulnerable groups, such as women and minorities, who have less bargaining power against wage discrimination and other forms of workplace inequality. Professor Marcellus Andrews of Bucknell University observes for minority small business owners and workers, lax antitrust enforcement has been a catastrophic intellectual and political policy mistake. But economic concentration is not the only anti-competitive threat to the prosperity of working families. Over the past several decades, the dramatic growth of excessive licensing requirements and the proliferation of non-compete clauses in employment contracts have become a turnstile for the employment of everyday workers a one-way restriction on economic opportunity that keeps jobs out of reach for too many working families. Today, nearly a third of American jobs require a state license, including many jobs that have little impact on public health or consumer safety. For example, to work as a security guard, a job that typically pays less than $30,000 annually, a Michigan resident must have three years of education and training. Other states require less than two weeks of training for the same job. And because these standards differ by state, licensing barriers have disproportionately affected the mobility and opportunity of military families, for example, which are 10 times more likely 
to relocate across state lines than other working families. Worse still, many states have used occupational licenses as leverage to collect student loan debt, suspending or even seizing these licenses from firefighters, nurses, teachers, psychologists, barbers, lawyers, real estate brokers, and others who have fallen behind on student loan payments. According to a New York Times investigation of this alarming phenomenon, there are at least 8,700 cases in which licenses were taken away or put at risk of suspension in recent years, although that tally almost certainly underestimates the true number. There is, this is nothing short of a weaponization of safety requirements against the economic security of working families. But to be clear, calls for reform of excessive licensing cannot serve as a springboard for Lochnerism or the erosion of each state's plenary authority to establish standards governing the health and safety of its own citizens. The Supreme Court has long recognized that states have broad power to enforce public health standards as a vital part of the state's police power. Equally important, we must distinguish excessive licensing, such as onerous and costly requirements for everyday professions, from the reasonable practice of establishing minimum qualifications for professions that affect public health and safety in each state. The benefits of sensible licensing practices, such as establishing educational requirements for doctors or nurses, or reducing the racial and gender wage gap, cannot be lost in this important conversation. There's also mounting evidence that the widespread use of non-compete clauses in everyday employment contracts is a fundamental threat to workers' economic freedom and mobility. These clauses are widespread even among workers who do not possess trade secrets, such as workers in the fast food industry. Last year, the Treasury Department reported that nearly 30 million working Americans at all levels of employment are covered by non-compete clauses. According to this report, these non-competes prevent workers from finding new employment even after being fired without cause. Less than a quarter of workers report that their jobs involve trade secrets, while less than half of non-compete agreements involve work subject to trade secrets. In fact, in many cases, workers have already accepted a job before they even see the text of an employment contract or are simply unaware that they've agreed not to work for competing businesses. And as another investigation by the New York Times notes, these clauses only add to the difficulties that hardworking Americans face in today's economy. And I quote, globalization and automation have put American workers in competition with overseas labor and machines. The rise of contract employment has made it harder to find a steady job. The decline of unions has made it tougher to negotiate, end quote. When combined with forced arbitration clauses, which immunize unscrupulous employers from virtually any legal accountability, non-compete clauses lock in workers even when they are in harmful, discriminatory workplaces. While these challenges are daunting, creating economic opportunity for working Americans must remain a national priority. Foremost, this means addressing corporate profit hoarding head on by raising the income of Americans who are working longer hours for less pay, working on holidays and weekends just to make it to the next paycheck. It's also essential that we invest in a stronger America that delivers good paying jobs through apprenticeship programs, on the job training and education, and a system of competition that helps workers and small businesses. House and Senate Democrats have proposed a better deal, a bold economic agenda to give workers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses new opportunities to get ahead. A better deal on competition means investing in a stronger America through a fair system of competition and economic freedom for all Americans, consumers, workers, and small businesses, not just big corporations that are getting even bigger. This vision of shared prosperity is more than just promises. We're committed to rolling up our sleeves and getting to the work of cracking down on economic concentration to make our economy open, fair, and competitive. We cannot allow corporate monopolies to dictate the economic freedom of workers in such fundamental and pervasive ways. Today's event also concerns the effects of economic concentration on innovation. More than 10 years ago, Dr. Vince Cerf, one of the architects of the internet, testified that a primary design goal of the internet was to make the network itself neutral with regard to the applications it supports. This principle of neutrality and non-discrimination created an environment of innovation without permission, meaning that startups, blogs, applications, and other edge providers did not need approval from gatekeepers to develop innovative services or contribute to the marketplace of ideas online. 
The Internet's design, Dr. Sir stated, places the power and functionality of the net in the hands of the end users, consumers, businesses, and application service providers. But today, control of information online, including the pathways for working Americans to access trustworthy news, commerce, and content, has become increasingly centralized among just a few online platforms with significant and durable power in winner-take-all markets for harvesting consumers' attention. Farhad Manju, a technology columnist at the New York Times, wrote last week that the internet as we know it is being, and I quote, carved into a historically profitable system of fiefs, transforming its promise of endless innovation into one stuck in mud, where every startup is at the tender mercy of some of the largest corporations on the planet, end quote. This transformation of the internet into a corporate playground, he notes, is the reason that the freewheeling internet has been dying a slow death, end quote. But the Trump administration's resolve to end net neutrality could be the final nail in the coffin of the fair, open, and innovative internet. Next week, under the Orwellian guise of reversing the decline in infrastructure investment, innovation, and options for consumers, the Federal Communications Commission will vote to repeal protections against blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization of consumers' access to lawful content online. To be clear, the FCC is not only reversing core net neutrality protections, it's clearing the table of all of the protections that have allowed the open internet to flourish and grow. This deregulatory train wreck is an unmitigated disaster for working people, small businesses, and innovation. It is beyond dispute that the openness is an engine of innovation and broadband investment. As the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit has said repeatedly over the past three years, internet openness is integral to ensuring low barriers to entry for competition and promoting the expansion and improvement of broadband infrastructure. These are important distinctions. There are important distinctions between broadband providers and platforms, but concerns regarding exclusionary conduct by platforms are not theoretical. Professor Frank Pasquale testified before the House Antitrust Subcommittee in 2008 that the, and I quote, concentrated control over the flow of information coupled with the ability to manipulate this flow may reduce economic efficiency by stifling competition, end quote. This discriminatory conduct is likely to result in high barriers to entry that depress competition because entrenched companies are more likely to have the necessary resources to preserve their market dominance, end quote. Nearly a decade later, we know that the ocean of data that platforms harvest from consumers every second has further entrenched this dominance and increased the risk of exclusionary conduct online. Coupled with machine learning and other incumbent advantages, there's little chance that startups today will even enter markets, let alone receive funding to compete with a dominant platform. And that's why we must ensure that the enduring principles of non-discrimination and openness apply to all levels of the internet. When working families pay their bill for broadband internet access, they expect to get what they pay for, access to the entire lawful internet, not just portions of it. That's true across the board, and it's unquestionably the most important element of the fight for the open internet. As Walt Mossberg, a pioneer of technology journalism who has covered this industry for decades, observed, and I quote, every day the internet becomes more of a platform for lousy ads, for increasing the power of a few rich companies, and for intrusive tracking. It's too important to leave unprotected, end quote. And that's why it's absolutely critical that we protect and promote competition in every market. We must aggressively fight anti-competitive transactions that allow incumbent industries to perpetuate their stronghold over commerce through acquisition after acquisition of future competitors. This evergreening of dominant platforms through consolidations must stop. As Professor Carl Shapiro recently noted, there would be a big payoff in terms of competition and innovation if the DOJ and FTC could selectively prevent mergers that serve to solidify the positions of leading incumbent firms, including dominant technology firms, by eliminating future challenges. This recommendation is consistent with a recent request by open Mar the Open Markets Institute urging the FTC to scrutinize the ability of dominant platforms to, quote, stifle innovation, undermine privacy, and divert readers and advertising revenue away from trustworthy sources of news and information, end quote. We also can't give up an inch of ground while enforcing the antitrust laws 
against monopolization and exclusionary conduct. In 1994, the Justice Department opened 22 cases alleging monopolization, but 20 years later, it didn't open any. To be clear, case law, not a lack of interest in promoting competition, is often the key factor determining whether the antitrust agencies will bring novel cases against monopolization. Our antitrust laws date back to 1890 and 1914 and were designed with railroads and oil tycoons in mind. These laws worked for much of the past century until recently. Congress must assess whether to modernize these laws for the 21st century economy. Fair and competitive markets are a vital condition for ensuring low barriers to entry and opportunities for new businesses, which invest in workers, services, and goods within the community, while generating the majority of the jobs in the US economy. But the benefits of antitrust enforcement are not merely economic. For over a century, policymakers have well understood that vigorous antitrust enforcement is one of the most important tools against autocracy and the corrosive effects of concentrated political power on our democratic institutions and values. Robert Potofsky, the former chairman of the FTC and dean of my law school, wrote in 1979 that we should keep these concerns in mind while enforcing the antitrust laws because an antitrust policy that failed to take political concerns into account would be unresponsive to the will of Congress and out of touch with the rough political consensus that has supported antitrust enforcement for almost a century. So as I um, bring my remarks to a close, I want to thank Barry Lynn, Matt Stoller, Nina Khan, and the entire Open Markets team for the work and for their tremendous passion on these issues. Uh, Barry and Open Markets uh, have worked tirelessly to document the power of monopolies to kill jobs and make existing jobs worse. Seven years ago, Barry co-authored one of the first deep looks at the effect of economic concentration on jobs and wages. He followed this with Corner, the new monopoly capitalism and the economics of destruction, an examination of modern day trusts and a sweeping indictment of the Chicago School of Economics. Since then, Barry and open his Open Markets team have been one of the leading voices for holding economic power accountable as today's event demonstrates. This work has greatly informed current policy discussions about how to address America's monopoly problem, and I know it will continue to do that. So I want to say thank you uh, for your leadership, Barry, and thank you to everyone who's been part of this effort. And finally, I want to say a special thank you to my brilliant counsel, Slade Bond, for all of his excellent work. Um, yeah, he deserves our zone. <laughs> and I, I look forward to working with all of you as we collectively try to address America's very serious monopoly problem. Thank you.